My name is Paul Downs. I'm a barrister at Quadrant Chambers. I have been a professional advocate for 30 years, and this Qubit talk is called How to Get Security for Costs. The first question is, what is security for costs? Well, in English civil procedure, at the end of the case, the usual rule is that the loser has to pay the winner's costs. And in heavy litigation, that can amount to millions of pounds. Nothing more annoying than winning a case only to find out that the losing party has no money to pay your costs. Imagine you're the poor defendant who gets dragged in from the outset. You win, but then you don't get any costs back. So security for costs is a way in which the court can order one party to secure the costs that will be incurred by the other party in the event that they win. The security is typically payment of money into court or a bank guarantee or cash held in a solicitor's escrow account. Those are the most common ways in which security is provided. And it is a very powerful advantage in civil litigation. It means that one side has to pay their own costs and also make provision for the other side's costs as well. There's sort of, it's like a double whammy in the burden of conducting the litigation. And if they fail to provide the security, the court can strike out the claim and their case is over. So how do you get security? Well, there are sort of six headings under which you can get security. There's quite a few. These are the main ones, anyway, in the civil procedure rules. The first is against a claimant company who appears unable to meet an adverse cost order. That's the most common ground for seeking security for costs. The second is security against a claimant that's resident outside the jurisdiction. The thirdly is security against a claimant who has rearranged their assets with a view to avoiding an adverse cost order. The fourth is security against a claimant who has given the wrong address or no address in the claim form. The fifth is sort of where there's another party lurking in the background controlling the litigation, so a nominal claimant or where the claimant has assigned a claim to a third party to avoid the costs or where somebody else is funding litigation for a share of the winnings. And the last is sort of a miscellaneous category. Under CPR 3 and CPR 24, when a party is in breach of an order or on a summary judgment application where the defence or claim looks very thin and the court says, well, you can go ahead, but the quid pro quo is you have to put some security into court. But by far the most common ground is security for costs or against a company that appears unable to meet an adverse cost order. So, how do you show that a company is unable to pay the costs if it loses? Well, actually, it's very easy. All you need to do is get hold of a recent set of that company's accounts. You get hold of the accounts and you look for the balance sheet. The balance sheet is the route into understanding whether the company can meet the cost order. In this particular balance sheet, you can see that the net assets of the company are just over a million pounds, £1,005,000. And it's usually very easy in a balance sheet to work out what the net assets are. Sometimes in a balance sheet, you will see all of the assets on one side and all of the liabilities on another, so it's less easy to work out what the net assets are. But a quick tip, just look for the profit and loss account and the share capital and add those together. The capital and reserves, that comes to exactly the same figure as the net assets. And you can see that at the bottom of this balance sheet. And here, because the figure is just over a million, the next thing you need to work out is, well, what's that figure going to look like at the end of the case? The litigation may take a couple of years to get through. And for that, you need to look at whether the company is making profit or loss. If the company is making a profit, you expect the net assets to improve over time. And if it's making a loss, you expect the net assets to go down. This particular company looks like it's making small losses. So that figure is not going to improve by the end of the case. And if your costs are more than the million pounds, your projected costs, and you can plausibly argue that your projected costs are more than a million pounds, you are game on. You must apply for security for costs. And the good news is you'll almost certainly get it. It's very rare that the courts turn down an application for security for costs where you've got a company that can't meet an adverse cost order. But what if there are no available accounts? Say the company is an offshore company and they don't file publicly available financial statements. Or let's say the accounts are not very recent, they're out of date and you want to know what the up-to-date position is. Well, again, it's very easy. You just say to the claimant, please disclose your recent accounts. And if they refuse, the courts will very readily assume that the accounts aren't great. And again, you're game on. You will get your security for costs. 
Now, the second ground is for a claimant who's resident outside the jurisdiction. It used to be very easy to get security for costs on this ground, but since a decision in 2002 called NASA and the United Bank of Kuwait, it's been held that the courts must not discriminate against someone simply because they're resident outside of the jurisdiction. So these days you can only get security at best for the additional costs of enforcing a judgment in the particular jurisdiction where they're based. And you cannot get security if the claimant is resident in a Hague Convention country. So that's the EU, most of South America, Canada, some of the Far East, and Australia and New Zealand. So again, not a great ground for getting security for costs. The third ground, though, is where the claimant has rearranged their assets. The test is objective. The court has jurisdiction if the effect of the claimant's dealings is to move assets beyond the reach of the successful litigant at the end of the case. A failure to disclose assets is enough for the court to infer that there's been a rearrangement of assets. And timing is not a bar. It doesn't matter if the claimant's been rearranging the assets before the proceedings are even started. Having said that those factors are not relevant for jurisdiction, once you've established jurisdiction, all of those factors come into play in determining how much security and in what form and when. The fourth ground is easy, it's self-explanatory, when the claimant fails to give an address on the claim form or gives an incorrect address. But that sort of ground rarely works because the claimant then just cures the problem and says, oh, I made a mistake and here's my correct address. And so it's very rare for security to be ordered on that ground. The fifth is where you have somebody else in the background, a nominal claimant or a claim that's been assigned and the like. You need to show there that the party who's really going to benefit from the litigation is not the claimant. And in that situation, the court will readily order security. The last two miscellaneous grounds, CPR 3, where there's been a breach of a court order, CPR 24, where there's been conditional leave to defend on a summary judgment application. But both have their problems. Firstly, the court is concerned not to make an order for security for costs if it will be disproportionate. So that means that the court won't really want to create a huge burden for a party if they think that the case is sufficiently meritorious to go to trial. And secondly, the court won't want to stifle a valid claim. So finally, there are some general points to have in mind. Firstly, when you're making your application for security for costs, don't go into the merits in any detail. The courts hate merit-based arguments. You know the argument that the claimant says, well, I'm bound to win, so I won't have to pay any costs at the end of the day anyway. The courts just disregard those arguments, so don't waste your time. The second is that the, most of those grounds are concerned with a claimant, but you can get security against the defendant if there's a substantial counterclaim, which means that in truth and reality, they are the real claimant. The claimant can be an appellant or a respondent who's cross-appealing, so you can get security for costs of an appeal, even if the appellant was originally the defendant. The practice is not to stifle a good claim, as I've said, but if you're going to run a stifling argument, the burden is firmly on you to establish that the claim will in fact be stifled. And it's not enough just to say, I haven't got any money to pay uh, for my claim if the security is ordered. What you've got to also show is you couldn't get the money from somewhere. There are no f supporters, no financiers, nobody you could borrow the money from, and that can be quite a difficult burden to cross. That's called the rule in York Motors. Security for costs is always discretionary. It's never automatic. So, for example, if the claimant can say, the only reason I haven't got any money is because of the defendant stole it all, then the court may weigh that in the discretion and not order security, or order security in a much reduced sum. That is how to get security for costs. Thank you.